speaker today is Dr. Bradford Wilcox, who is the director of the National Marriage Project and associate professor of sociology at the University of Virginia, also a visiting scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies. Dr. Wilcox's research is focused on marriage, fatherhood, and cohabitation, especially on the ways that the family structure, civil society, and culture influence the quality and stability of family life in the United States, but also in other countries. His research has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, and many other media outlets around the globe. Dr. Wilcox is the co-director of the World Family Map Project and will share new international family research, which examines how family structure and poverty affect children's health. Dr. Wilcox. Thank you for that introduction. It's great to be here this morning. I want to begin just by uh, acknowledging that much of my remarks today are derived from the World Family Map, a new initiative from Child Trends, uh, the Doha Institute and Institute for Family Studies to uh, examine the quality and stability of family life around the globe. And you can see um, an example of our uh, most recent report up here on the screen um, in front of you. So in the last half century, much of the globe has witnessed dramatic changes in the nature and character of family life, fallout from what demographers call the second demographic transition. Two of the most notable changes associated with this transition have been marked declines in fertility and in marriage across much of the world, from shrinking birth rates in Shanghai to surging rates of single parenthood in Stockholm, much of the world has been swept up in what the New York Times has called a post-familial cultural tide. This demographic transition has many important implications, but today we're going to focus on answering one important question. That is, how is this transition affecting ch children uh, the world over? And of course, I think much of our international attention has been focused more clearly on falling fertility on the retreat from parenthood around the globe, which has left policymakers and journalists from Spain to South Korea scrambling to boost and consider uh, their own national birth rate. All this is not surprising given that about half of the world's country, the fertility rate has fallen below replacement level of 2.1 births per child. Indeed, falling fertility rates in many countries in the Americas and Europe and East Asia have raised alarms among policymakers, scholars, and business leaders, given that long-term low fertility leads to declines in the labor force and increases in the ratio of elderly who are dependent upon the working age population. In the words of Nicholas Eberstadt, these demographic trends portend ominous changes in economic prospects for many developed countries, major increases in public debt patterns, and slower economic growth. So clearly one important concern with the transition here is falling fertility. But family change is not just about the number of babies being born in nations around the globe. It's also about the nature of the homes that are being, kids are being born into and raised within. And what we're seeing is that a growing number of children being born or raised outside of a married home around much of the globe. So first we can consider the retreat from marriage and its implications for single parenthood and family instability. And what we can see is that around the world and in many countries, there's been a dramatic increase in childbearing outside of marriage, uh, particularly once again in the Americas um, and in Europe. What this means is that more than 40% of kids in many countries um, in the Americas and Western Europe from Colombia to the United States to Sweden are being born outside of marriage. And this is significant because they're much more likely to end up experiencing family instability um, and single motherhood. So we can see, for instance, here that kids who are born um, outside of marriage to cohabiting couples in countries as varied as France, Spain, and the United States are more, more likely to see their parents break up by the age of 15 which of course is one indicator of instability and then in turn leads to, uh, to single parenthood. This basic pattern is also seen even in Sweden, which probably has the most stable rates of cohabitation of any country in the world. 
Uh, even in Sweden, children born to cohabiting parents are 79% more likely to see their parents break up compared to children born to married parents. And what this means in part is that kids who are experiencing more uh, non-marital childbearing, more cohabitation, are more likely to end up in a home without their two parents, represented here by the bars in red and yellow. So countries ranging from Colombia to the United States to Sweden, as this figure illustrates, um, are much more likely to be spending time outside of a two-parent family because of this global retreat from marriage. Indeed, more than 20% of kids in the Americas and much of Western Europe and also in Sub-Saharan Africa are currently spending time living outside of a two-parent family, as the most recent World Family Map indicates. And in these regions, it's important to note that many, many more kids will spend some time um, in a single-parent family. So the bottom line here is that the retreat from marriage, which has affected in particular and most saliently much of the Americas and Europe, has led to weaker and more unstable families, to more single parenthood and more family instability. And what's, what's the big deal? Why does this matter? What's the consequence of this? Well, we, we know from data um, in the West that kids who are raised outside of an intact two-parent family are more likely to struggle with emotional and physical health concerns, with social concerns, um, and to experience more poverty and economic immobility. And I want to be clear here, I was raised by a single mother, and I think many kids who are raised by single parents can indeed flourish. But I'm also a sociologist. What I'm telling you is that kids who are raised in a single parent household are more likely to struggle compared to kids who have their own two married parents um, you know, in the picture. So in the United States, for instance, we see that boys who are raised um, in a single parent household are about twice as likely to end up incarcerated by the time they turn 30 compared to boys raised in their own um, married household. So not having a father to give them the direction, the affection, um, and the discipline that they need uh, to grow up well and to steer clear of trouble with the law uh, has a clear impact here uh, in this slide. But dads matter also for daughters. We can see here that girls who are raised in a home where dad is leaving, particularly at a young age, are much more likely to end up pregnant as teenagers compared to girls whose fathers are there for the duration of their childhood. So not having a dad's affection, his attention, um, his concern is linked to a greater risk of ending up pregnant for teens uh, in the US and indeed this pattern is seen around much of the globe. Kids who are raised in two-parent homes in the US are also much more likely to end up graduating from college. Um, they're more likely to acquire the human capital that they need to flourish in, in today's contemporary marketplace. There's also a larger ecological story that we're beginning to see now in more sophisticated research. This comes from a new study from Harvard and Berkeley uh, looking at community level effects of family structure um, on child uh, mobility. That is the odds that kids will start off poor as, you know, as kids in a community and then rise up to the upper um, the upper quintile. And what this story here shows from Harvard is that kids who are born in, in communities where there are lots of two-parent families, born poor, are much more likely to make it up the economic ladder uh, than kids who are born poor in communities with lots of single-parent families. So Raj Chetty to Harvard has said that community family structure is, quote, the single strongest correlate of upper mobility for communities across the United States. So this, once again, is a point about the way in which the ecology, the family ecology, shapes the odds of kids' economic success uh, in the United States. But what about other countries, other regions of the world? Does this basic story obtain um, outside of the US? And if you look uh, in the West, um, across the Atlantic, um, from the US to Sweden, we see that some of these basic patterns are replicated also in Sweden. So a study in Sweden that focused on the entire population of Swedish children um, found that kids in single parent homes in Sweden were about twice as likely to experience uh, important psychological, social, um, and other pathologies compared to kids raised in two parent families. Uh, you can see here that the odds of suicide and of drug addiction for kids in Sweden are much higher, about twice as high um, for kids in single parent families compared to two parent families. Likewise, in the Rural Family Map, we found that kids who were raised in a single-parent family in Sweden were about 78% uh, 
uh, more likely, or not 78% more likely, of repeating a grade in school compared to kids in two parent families. So my point here simply is that there's a lot of good evidence, uh, both in Europe and in North America, uh, that the two parent family gives kids some important benefits. But what about outside the West, extending your gaze beyond just Europe <coughs> and North America? And we see that much of, much of Asia, uh, Latin America, um, and the Middle East, that kids are more likely to flourish when they're in two parent homes and in stable homes. So if we take, for instance, literacy, what we can see is that in countries ranging from Colombia to Qatar to Indonesia, children from single parent homes are less likely to excel um, in their own language compared to their peers uh, from two parent homes. And all the slides that I presented have been controlling for parents' background factors, things like you know, education, uh, wealth, uh, and age. The same basic story holds when it comes to looking at kids being held back in school. Um, and we can see that kids raised outside of a two-parent home um, are more likely to be held back in school in countries ranging from Chile to Jordan um, to Singapore. So there's a consistent story here, once again, of two-parent families giving kids a leg up when it comes to school um, around much of the globe. How do we explain the two-parent advantage? What, what accounts for this, um, this advantage that kids who are raised from uh, two-parent homes uh, tend to manifest? Well, one point, of course, is that two parents tend to have more time that they can devote to their kids compared to a single parent. A second point, of course, is they tend to have more money that they pool together, both from their own, perhaps, jobs, but also from their extended families. A third point is they tend to have the ability to give their kids more affection um, and to be more supportive, in part because parenting is less stressful, typically, for two parents um, compared to a single parent. They're able to draw more readily on two sets of kin, um, and then they're more likely to give their kids a stable family context and to remain um, in the same area. All of these things end up uh, redounding to the benefit of their children. The final big point that I want to make today about family structure and child well-being is that scholars are, are paying more and more attention to the role of family stability um, and not just family structure and the welfare of kids. So because of that, the Royal Family Map focused this year on the impact of family instability um, and family structure um, on child health in lower income countries. And we did so in part because the UN Millennium Development Goals seek to improve, as all of you know, the health of children um, around the globe. But this focus on child health has not given much attention to the family context of children's health. And so it's for that reason that we focused on that in the 2014 edition of the World Family Map. We focused on four regions, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And these regions are visually displayed right here uh, in this slide. One outcome is diarrhea, which as all of you know is a major uh, public health concern uh, around much of the globe. And what this slide suggests to us is that children in single parent, um, in divorced, um, or in step families were about one-fifth more likely to have diarrhea, particularly in Latin America and Africa, compared to kids in stable two-parent families. We also saw a higher risk of uh, stunted growth for kids in never married and divorced families um, compared to two-parent stable families in much of Latin America, Africa, and Asia. And finally, probably the most important outcome, of course, for kids is mortality. Uh, and here what we saw is that kids um, in uh, Latin America, in Africa, um, and in Asia were about 20% at least 20% more likely to end up dying um, compared to kids in stable two-parent families. Once again, these are all controlling for uh, parental education, um, wealth, uh, and age. There's a clear association between more stability uh, for kids um, and better child health outcomes. When you present results like this, I think the obvious question that you get is, you know, aren't these findings really about money? Well, we don't think this is the case for this latest series of analyses because it turns out that in many of these regions, it's the case that kids from divorced homes are actually more, more well off. Um, it's in those homes where, you know, 
people are more likely to get divorced. It's also the case too that we controlled for a wealth as a background factor here. So these are kind of results net of considering the importance of wealth. So what's going on here? We have a couple of theories about how family instability may affect children's health. One idea is that when there's family instability um, is that parents may have less uh, time to devote to the care um, of their kids, you know, to monitoring their kids' health um, and helping them when they're in some kind of medical difficulty. A second idea here is that family instability is for many people stressful. So that it may affect the ability of parents to give the best care um, to their kids. Um, and we also know too that stress is a physiological impact on um, both adults and kids. Um, it tends to affect our immune system, for instance. So the stress associated with family instability may have a direct physical impact um, on the welfare of children. And then the third idea is that family instability may dis disrupt um, social support networks. Uh, kinship networks, friendship networks um, that might otherwise um, boost the physical welfare of children, um, in this case, in the developing world. So I've given you some sobering news about the impact of family structure and family instability on child welfare. But I want to conclude my remarks uh, today by stressing some good news. And that is that if we look at trends both in terms of family structure, family stability, um, and family culture, what we see is that marriage remains quite strong in two major regions of the world, um, in Asia and the Middle East. And really across the globe, it's still the case that a clear majority of kids are being raised um, in two-parent married families, um, even in much of Europe um, and the Americas. And the third point is that a majority of global adults think that the two-parent family is ideal for kids. There's kind of a cultural commitment to our aspiration to the two-parent family that continues to persist around the globe. The next slides give you a sense of what that means kind of empirically. So in our own research on family instability, what we can see is that for young children, um, more than 90% of them in Asia and the Middle East are still in a stable two-parent family. And that's typically a, a two-parent married family, of course, um, in Asia and the Middle East. So that's just one indication of the way in which uh, marriage and family stability still have a tremendous measure of purchase in Asia and the Middle East. The second point in terms of culture is that even though we still, or we see a rising level of, uh, of family instability and single parent across much of the globe, it's still the case that in every country except for Sweden, um, that we, we can measure in the World Value Survey, there is um, clear support for the notion that um, children need, quote, a father and a mother to grow up happily, unquote. So the point here is that there is clear cultural support for the two-parent ideal um, around uh, the vast uh, majority of the nations where adults are surveyed um, in the World Value Survey in countries as varied as, um, as France, uh, China, uh, Nigeria, um, Argentina, and, um, and uh, New Zealand. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights declared that, quote, the family is the natural and fundamental group unit of society and is entitled to protection by society and the state, unquote. This is so in part because the social and economic wealth of nations depends in no small part on the health of the family. Families develop human and social capital on children, giving them the experiences, skills, and character they need to succeed in today's global economy. And from today's talk, we can see that across much of the globe, families are most likely to succeed in forming children when they are headed by married, stably married two parents. For that reason, uh, in my view, the path towards continued social, economic, and physical progress for the world's children lies in part in protecting marriage and family life in regions where they are strong and in renewing marriage and family life in regions where they have lost ground. I leave it to all of you to figure out how we can go about strengthening and stabilizing family life around the world. Thank you.